So hi, everybody. Thank you and welcome to the second session of the International Deprescribing Journal Club. We're going to be starting the session in about two minutes. Um, we're just letting some people in from the waiting room. Okay, so welcome everyone to the second session of the International Deprescribing Journal Club. Just uh, as we're letting some people in, um, this is a, an international deprescribing journal club. And it's actually the product of a collaboration between several networks um, across the world. So the Australian Deprescribing Network, US Deprescribing Network, the Network of European Researchers in Deprescribing, the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy, and um, the Canadian Medication Appropriateness and Deprescribing Network. So uh, we're really excited to be hosting our second session um, and handling time zones across the world. It's been a lot of uh, fun figuring out how to do that. I just want to say that today's session was organized with the help of the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy. So um, for this reason, we'd really like to warmly thank the S. CP, including the organizing committee members. So that's um, Monica Letters, Daniela Fialova, Betul Okoyan, um, Stephen uh, Byrne, and Zachariah Jamal Nazar. Um, all of these researchers and clinicians from different uh, areas in the continents thought that, you know, we needed to have a way to connect and discuss ideas. So that's one of the reasons why we're here today and why we've been having the International Journal Club. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Emily McDonald, and I'm the scientific director of the Canadian Medication Appropriateness and Deprescribing Network, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. Um, I think we've all found that we across the world have a lot of interesting deprescribing publications, research, some really complex clinical cases. And so this was really how this journal club was born. We wanted a way to get together and to discuss new, exciting, emerging research, as well as to discuss some challenging cases and, and it, whenever possible, try and link the two together to really ground the research in our clinical practice. Um, one of our goals is really to foster connections and collaborations. Um, we definitely want to bring different clinicians and researchers together so that, um, you know, if there are opportunities in the future for us to work together, that this is one way for us to kind of meet and chat uh, both formally and informally. So just... Um, uh, a little reminder, um, to help with the audio quality during the presentation today, please keep your microphone muted. Um, we do know that everyone's not able to attend the session and some people may be looking to catch up. So we are recording the session. Um, and so please take note uh, that the recording is gonna be posted on our uh, Caden YouTube channel later today. Um, our YouTube channel also has um, recordings of the first journal club that we did, uh, which was uh, led by Louise papillon Ferland. Um, who presented the key learnings from the optimized trial and discussed barriers and enablers to deprescribing applied to real life clinical cases. So if you missed that one, that one's also available. And our speakers today have agreed to share the PDF version of the slides after the session. So they'll be available on our website as well. So you can see the, the link is up there on the slide. Um, hello. Yes, hello. Sorry, I'm here. The camera and stuff isn't working, but I got in using a different laptop. No problem. Hi, Dan. Welcome. We're just doing introductions. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation today, um, just you can use the feature where you raise your hand. Um, most likely we'll do the questions at the end, uh, but we will keep track of them as we go along. So if the, you know, during the Q&A, you might want to share some thoughts or questions verbally, just raise your hand and then we'll call upon you. And just moving on to the agenda for today. So we do have the uh, presentation. How, how is that? How do you feel about that, Leon? <laughs> Possible? Hi. Sorry, I disappeared. I'm back again, I think. Great. Hello. <laughs> We're having Sorry. a little bit of technical difficulties, but I think we should be able to work through it. 
Um, Leon, were you wanting to maybe introduce your team and then hand over the slides to a team member? Um, sure. Well, I was just going to do a kind of brief introduction around the project, and then each some of the team members will then have a a bit um, a bit more in depth about the project or different parts of it. Okay. What's the yep. next one over? So I sympathy. It's a three year project and it's working in three different jurisdictions in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland and it works across primary care and secondary care and I sympathy stands for Im implementing stimulating innovation in the management of polypharmacy and adherence through the years. So next slide please. Um, and that's our that's our team. So what do we do? So we deliver um, effective medication uh, reviews and they're patient-centered pharmacist led and we look at polypharmacy and as I mentioned we work across three different jurisdictions and uh, we liaise with uh, doctors, nurses, consultants and other members of the healthcare team um, and why do we do it? We want to even enable those patients with multiple morbidities to live healthier and more active lives. So I simply it's a shared decision-making process and we recognize in the project that experts in healthcare, they include the healthcare professionals, um, they include the policy makers, policy makers, but then we also recognize that the patients are experts in their own care and their own needs. So we take a holistic medication review approach. And we put the patient and their family at the heart of every decision and we empower them to be uh, genuine partners in their own care. So next please. So the aims of appropriate polypharmacy means that all drugs um, are prescribed for the purpose of achieving um, specific therapeutic objectives and that have been agreed with the patient. And this means that there's um, that their objectives have been achieved or there's a real chance to be achieved in the future and that the drug therapy has been optimized. It means that the patient is also motivated to take the medication and to minimize the risk of adverse drug reactions. Um, and they want to take all the medication as intended. So an example of appropriate polypharmacy we sometimes talk about is if a patient suffers a heart attack and is prescribed two antiplatelets, a proton pump inhibitor, a statin, a beta blocker, and an ACE inhibitor. Uh, so these are six medications to be taken daily, but this would be deemed appropriate polypharmacy. And part of the, the World Health Organization Global Patient Safety Challenge um, medication without harm includes appropriate management of polypharmacy as a key priority to reduce medication related harm and th that's a core part of our work in, in eye sympathy. So we have a couple of key resources that we use. We have the seven steps to polypharmacy, appropriate polypharmacy um, process and as I mentioned it puts the patient in the centre and involves them in their decision making and provides a structure for us for the review process and it's a tool for embedding a single approach to polypharmacy. And we also have decision support tools for patients and carers and practitioners, and it helps the patients to be more involved in their decision-making, and it helps um, patients to know what to expect at their review, and it's a, a toolkit for, for practitioners. And we also, um, on the websites, we have um, what are called patient-related outcome measures or PROMs, and I'll talk about those a bit more later on. So next, please. So the seven steps to polypharmacy. So as I mentioned, we, we put the patient right at the center um, and we ask them what matters to them. And then we, we go through the different steps. Um, so if you wanna click on, we go through each one separately. So what matters to the patient? So um, we help them to understand the objectives of the drug therapy and managing their existing health problems and maybe prevention of future health problems. We identify additional or essential drug therapy. And so those are those ones that have a, say, a replacement function like levothyroxine or prevent rapid symptom decline, such as drugs for Parkinson's disease or heart failure. So those are ones that, that we would deem that are essential, much no matter what. Um, next, next slide, please. And then we look for unnecessary drug therapy. So they, they may have been ones with temporary indications or higher than usual maintenance doses. Um, or with limited benefit um, for the indication that they're used for. Or, and we look at things such as the, the numbers needed to treat and, and what's the expected benefit or the, the long-term effects of these drugs. We ask then, are therapeutic objections being achieved? Um, did they achieve symptom control? Are they achieving our clinical targets? 
are they preventing disease progression or exacerbation? Um, we look at adverse drug reactions and side effects, um, such as drug drug interactions, cumulative toxicities, um, adverse reactions, for example, through laboratory markers of hypo hypokalemia, and then drugs that are used to um, treat adverse reactions caused by other drugs, so things like uh, sick day rules and ensuring that the patients know what to do with their medications when they fall ill. Um, and of course, then we also look at is drug therapy cost effective? Um, more savings for for the the health service in general and if a patient can use one drug that's more cost effective than another that's that's always good for overall um and then finally does the patient understand the, um, the outcomes of the review are they willing and able to take the drug therapy as as we intend next slide then So um, some of the evaluation tools that we use in eye sympathy. So it's a research project. So um, although we're collecting data and it can be a bit time consuming, it's it's very important to understand the value of the project. So we use a number of research tools. So we use a clinical uh, grading system. We use a medicine appropriateness index. We've modified that to be person-centered. We use polypharmacy indicators and we use uh, the patient recorded reported outcome measures, the PROMs, pre and post. And we also um, gather probably more anecdotal feedback from other clinicians, from GPs, nurses, consultants, and that helps us um, within the service then to kind of um, maybe direct or target patients or, or, look at, or look at problems that arise throughout the project. So um, the, first, the first kind of evaluation tool we use is the Eden Clinical Intervention Grading. Um, so we look at uh, the problem, we look at the intervention, and then we grade it as a score uh, one to six so one being a score detrimental to the patient and six being potentially life-saving um, the problems that we come across or the interventions that we come across are generally drug interventions adherence and uh, review of patients medications maybe a formally change patient or care ed education um, and our referrals to other uh, health, pro health professionals and we also use a patient-centered MAI, so patient-centered medicines appropriateness index, um, and uh, it's carried out for 10% of patients. And we it's an weighted tool, so it allocates a score to the to each medicine based on the appropriateness for that patient at that time. So we look at things: is are is the medication indicated? Is it effective in the condition? Is it the use? Um, are there drug interactions? Is there duplication? Is the duration appropriate? And this is calculated pre and post review so we can compare um, the scoring of the, the patient's um, PCMA before and after. Yeah. Next slide. Oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Back. Sorry, I missed that. So the polypharmacy indicators, um, so it comes from the, um, the realistic pres prescribing guidance. Um, um, by the Scottish Therapeutics. And some examples, these help to kind of direct us to which patients to look at. Um, and some examples of polypharmacy indicators would be patients prescribed an oral anticoagulant and a non-steroidal. Um, they may be um, over 65 and prescribed three more drugs with sedating or anticholinergic effects. They may be on a steroid long-term without bone protecting agents. So there's a number of these um, that we look at and they help, I suppose, identify patients that, that we can review um, and make a significant change. Um, and finally, one of the, the tools we use is the patient-related outcome measure. So this is, um, has, the patient has questions on an app or a paper version to answer before and after the review. And it helps the patients to prepare and think about what matters to them. Um, and it also gives the health practitioner a bit of information before the review and can highlight issues with adherence for us. Okay, and over to Joanne. Thanks, Leon. Um, hello, everybody. It's uh, brilliant to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, I wanted to give you the perspective from Northern Ireland, and we are the little country with the multicolored blue counties beside the yellow. Thank you. <laughs> so we have about 1.8 million people. And as a country, we have a response to the World Health Organization, third global challenge as well. Um, the hospital I work in is Antrimaria Hospital. So it's in the county famous for the Giants Causeway, the dark hedges if you're Game of Thrones fans. So it's a really beautiful country, come, come and visit. Um, 
but our hospital is a district general hospital so we have about 366 acute medical beds um, and that's where we have based ourselves for the reviews and actually we have found that to be a really a good place to do reviews. Um, there are benefits to that bit there and there are challenges, of course. Um, some benefits have been if a patient has been admitted with COPD and the, the memory of the fear of not being able to breathe is so fresh in their memory, it's a good time to talk about smoking cessation and lifestyle changes. Um, the wards are so busy with patients coming in and going out that they, the pharmacists don't have time to do in-depth medication reviews. So it's been a really good opportunity for us. Um, and we're there to help with the identification of adverse drug reactions or unmet needs. Um, but I suppose it has been a bit of a, a, a change because the acute setting is for identification of the acute need and treatment of that acute need. And while I am considering that very much, I'm also looking at the patient holistically. And I suppose that has been a, a little bit of a change. Um, and sometimes patients can say, oh, I'd, I'd like to stop my antidepressant today. And I say, great, day one of your hospital stay perhaps isn't the day to do that, but let's have a conversation about it. And let's talk to your, your GP um, about doing that whenever you leave hospital. Um, so yes, so did we, we have looked at some sort of results for the first 1,000 patients. Um, and we are reducing, you know, the, the PCMAI score has reduced. So that means we're stopping inappropriate medicines. We're making interventions and 94% are grade four and above, which means they are significant to the patient, the patient's care. Um, we have three grade six interventions, which are potentially life-saving. Um, um, feedback certainly has been very positive from both patient and staff. Um, and we have patients have an average of seven long term conditions, as well as the reason for admission, which we would obviously have to consider as well. Um, I suppose the thing there is our medicines numbers are reducing very slightly from 12.6 to 12.3. So I have analysed um, 192 patients to see what medicine changes we're making, because it feels like we're stopping a lot, <laughs> um, but the numbers aren't reflecting that. So we're stopping medicines in about 50% of patients and reducing doses in about 35% of patients. But I'm starting medicines in 50% of patients. And whenever I themed the medicines I'm starting, you know, the three largest themes, the first one is nutritional and electrolyte deficiency. So I order my own lab if I'm suspicious of something, and then I'll start potassium, iron, etc. So this is short term. My second group was items for comfort. So for example, I had a patient I was following up yesterday, and she said, oh, my legs are so itchy with the, the continence pads. So I got her a cream for itch and a moisturizer. So there's two items I have added. But it, it's for hospital only, you know, will make her, her life there a bit easier. Um, and the other, the third theme was nicotine replacement therapy, and that could be for patients who do want to stop smoking, but it'll be also the patients who cannot, we can't smoke in the hospital grounds, so it'll be a bit of um, relief for them while they're there as well. So I think that number needs a wee bit of, of colour just to explain it a little. Um, so I suppose I thought I would present to you what I think is the value, what are, what are the added value that our reviews um, are bringing, and I thought about about inappropriate medicine use. Um, so using the seven steps, I sympathy tool, we're able to identify all those non-essential medicines which aren't needed. Um, and actually by discussing them with the patient and this shared decision-making, the patients can tell us about medicines they no longer think are appropriate. Um, and I mean, I'm sure we've all seen the patients who have had their medicines stopped without discussion, without counseling, without tapering. Um, so this, the power of this conversation is really important. And discussion about adherence issues, sorry, did you slip back there, um, adherence issues, um, I think through our conversations we're giving the patients permission to tell us they are not taking medicines the way perhaps they have been told or the way they should. Um, um, I've had examples where patients are taking a Pixaban once a day because nobody ever told me to take the second one. Um, ladies cutting up really large vitamin tablets tablets because they can't swallow them. So I can give you an alternative way to take that. Um, or patients who just don't like taking some of their medicines. So those can come out with really good conversations. And the last one, there's patient education and empowerment. Um, so, sometimes a lot of patients are very passive about their health and, and are happy for things to be done to them. Um, so it's getting patients to be empowered and to 
to take on some ownership, I suppose, of their health and medicines. And, you know, giving them information about anxiety support or, or um, sleep hygiene and lifestyle issues um, to help them sort of have a wee bit more empowerment there. Um, other things then we had thought of are health literacy. I mean, we know that about 50% of patients do not have um, enough health literacy um, skills. And certainly through our conversations, I'm finding lots of health literacy as sort of alarm bells. Um, I had a patient who was in his 40s who I discovered the day after the review when I went back to see him. He couldn't read, couldn't read anything. Um, I had patients who are getting really dubious information from really dubious sources, um, especially in around COVID vaccinations. You know, that's probably the most topical one recently. And um, so being able to sort of point people in the direction um, and engage them in their healthcare has been good. Adverse drug reactions. So these patients we are seeing will have been seen by a medic. They'll uh, most those cases have been seen by a pharmacist as well. So all the kind of common adverse drug reactions have been picked up. So the ibuprofen causing a GI bleed has been picked up or the anticholinergic burden causing falls. Um, but through our conversations, we've been able to identify a lot more adverse drug reactions. So for example, I had a patient who um, was on azathioprine for inflammatory bowel disease. She had been admitted because of constipation and abdominal pain and they were resolving because we started laxatives and painkillers so she's due to go home and just through discussing discussing how she manages her IBD she said oh this azathioprine has been great I've been on it five or six weeks and I thought mm, abdominal pain I checked amylase was raised and we have a new azathioprine so she actually had azathioprine induced pancreatitis and um, so I was able to stop the azathioprine and refer her to GI and um, or other people whenever you're reviewing labs you know a lady with bone profile and in our bone profile we have alkaline phosphatase so nobody has checked liver function <laughs> tests and um, so I requested those they're all raised so I can stop the statin and whenever I look back she's four months been on her statin and the other thing I suppose is con um, contributing factors are important information for admission and they could be simple things like a person is the only carer for their partner um, but it could also be things that's important for their um, diagnosis I suppose um, I had a lady who was being investigated for cirrhosis of the liver and she and all through the documentation she drinks one or two glasses of wine a week and I thought mm, I'm just not sure about that and if I ask the same question in the same way I'm going to get the same answer so uh, we did a lot of discussion I discovered a few other things which were important but I also discovered that she her minimum alcohol intake was actually three bottles of wine a week so that changes the diagnosis and the treatment of this liver cirrhosis and um, so it's just I suppose being inquisitive I think is probably um, one of the things um, and I think whenever we started we, you know this what matters to you is central to everything as Leon said it's the central thing it's asking the patient what is important to you um, and I think at the start we identified in hospital we were maybe needed to increase our skills and how to um, manage difficult conversations and we had some input from a psychology service in the trust and that has helped in so many ways and um, for example motivational interviewing and um, I had a patient who said every time she goes to the hospital every time she goes to the doctors they say stop smoking and she did not want to stop smoking she said to me I don't even want to talk about it just leave me alone so before I would have sort of stepped away but she's a really severe lung condition so her smoking five a day isn't going to be helping and actually at the end of the conversation she said herself do you think I could reduce this and I said yes I think you could so a month later she has reduced to two cigarettes a day so it's a that motivational interviewing has definitely given us a little bit of confidence and the other thing would be in the discussion of mental health issues we do come across patients with mental health issues and um, I had one patient who I had to listen for what was unsaid actually rather than what was said and eventually we came and um, I asked her was she feeling suicidal and she said she was and she hadn't told anyone else and um, so I was able to get mental health to come and see her that day and onward referral in the community so I think I'm not afraid now to sort of um, bring up those conversations I think for us as well being in hospitals hard and <laughs> um, so having a patient advocate is really important um, and we've had to speak up for patients um, on a number of occasions so it could be for referrals or just even things 
during their hospital stay. So, you know, could we move that person to this bed that has a curtain because he's got diarrhea? Um, or a patient who I sort of had to quite strongly advocate for, I didn't want them discharged because in the last three years he hasn't been able to make any cardiology appointments so if we send him home he's still not going to be able to make them <laughs> can we not discharge this patient um, and I had a bit of um, work to do with that one um, but I suppose to, to sort of end on a personal note I think this training and using the seven steps and all my interactions with patients have definitely developed confidence and courage and ability um, and I suppose the ripple down effect of that because I now have junior pharmacists who say I now do this because I saw you do that or I do this because you taught me that um, so I think that will also be um, another good legacy to have as well um, I'm going to hand over to the Scottish team now actually who are going to do barriers and enablers and they're very much the same as ours um, in Northern Ireland we are prescribers but don't have electronic as prescribing although it's coming so um, yeah our barriers and labor enablers will align with Scotland there so I'll hand over to you. Hi there, hi everyone. So this is I Sympathy from a Scottish perspective. So three health boards have been involved with the Eye Sympathy Project um, since, um, since it started. NHS Dumfries and Galloway, NHS Ayrshire and Arran and NHS Highland. So currently we have um, one pharmacist working within NHS Dumfries and Galloway. We have two pharmacists in NHS Ayrshire and Arran and there's no one currently working in NHS, um, NHS Highland. Can move on? Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, at, so there's two pharmacists, myself, Laura Urquhart and Leslie Heard, who uh, work in an Ayrshire and Arran, and we are working in primary care. So we are fairly new to the project. We joined about four, four, just over four months ago. So we are based at a large district general hospital, um, University Hospital Cross House in Kilmarnock. So we have about 517 acute beds. NHS Ayrshire and Arran has... Um, some other secondary care facilities, which is a smaller district general, two long stay rehabilitation wards, and four community hospitals. And um, NHS Ayrshire and Arran serves a population of about 367,000 and covers an area of um, just less than uh, 3,400 kilometres squared. So um, Nicola, I'm one of the project pharmacists in Dumfries and Galloway. So in Dumfries and Galloway, they decided to base their project pharmacist within the diabetes outpatients department within the main hospital in Dumfries. So Dumfries and Galloway has a population of around 149,000 and covers a total area of 6,426 kilometres squared. So it is a strongly rural area of Scotland with a high elderly population. And this is what motivated me to offer an adaptable delivery model for the reviews. So the reviews that I do are delivered in one of three ways adapted to the needs of the patient. So this can either be the traditional face-to-face -face appointment, which suits those that stay local to the centre, we have NHS Near Me appointments, which is a virtual appointment and is popular with those competent using technology and not wanting to travel. And then lastly, I also offer telephone appointments, which is probably the most popular method given the rurality of the area and also the high elderly population, as these patients account for the majority of the reviews and they are not keen on travelling long distances to appointments and don't tend to be very tech savvy. So this adaptable delivery model ensures that the project is able to reach out to all diabetes patients across the Fries and Galloway and in particular those most in need of a review. So why diabetes? Why did um, De Fries and Galloway choose to base me within the diabetes service as a setting for the Eye Sympathy Project? So diabetes is a complex multi-system disorder which is increasing in prevalence in Scotland. Crude prevalence ranges between 49 to 6.9% in NHS boards across Scotland with De Fries and Galloway being one of the highest at 67 
percent. So as we know, diabetes is a progressive condition leading to increasing intensity of therapy as well as requiring additional treatment for its potential complications and comorbidities. Therefore, polypharmacy is always going to be inevitable. So pass back to Laura, who will go over our enablers and barriers. Thank you. So yeah, I'm going to start with um, some enablers. Um, so obviously within the secondary care or hospital environment on the ward, we already have established multidisciplinary team working. So we have the consultants, the junior doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, dietitians. We also have access or can contact kind of social work. So if we, during our review, identify adherence issues, we can make referrals onto social work to help with adherence when patients get at home. Um, next. <clears throat> oh, yeah, thanks. So we also have access to medical notes via what's called the clinical portal. So this allows us to have access to clinic or outpatient letters or can see any referrals made to secondary care. So we're also fortunate to have um, access to some other health boards clinical portals. So this is really useful if a patient has um, had a tertiary referral to a specialist centre, we can see clinic letters or outpatient letters from these specialist centres. Next. We also have uh, access to what's called the emergency care summary. So this allows us basic access to information about patients' medication in um, GP practice. So we can see what patients have currently prescribed on, 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 repeat, may, uh, on repeat and we can see any acute prescriptions that they've had recently and also um, information um, about their allergy status. Next. Oh, next. Yeah. So in NHS Asia and Naren, we're fortunate to have an electronic prescribing system, which is very useful. Um, so we can access information on, the, on prescribing from previous admissions. So we can see what was stopped and what was started. We have access to the pharmaceutical care plans that have been produced in these admissions. And we also have access to the discharge letters that was sent to the GP practice. Um, so it's really good, you can see um, what's happened in previous admissions. We also have, there's also multiple resources from iSympathy that we can, we can use. Um, there's um, things like decision-making tools and, and other resources that we have access to. Next. So for Leslie and I, um, who are fairly new into the project, support from peers and leads on the project has been invaluable. So we regularly contact um, other um, eye sympathy pharmacists for advice or just kind of to discuss a patient and what, what they think we should we do with a patient. So this has been really valued, as I say, really valuable to us because, as I say, we're fairly, fairly new. Next. Oh, next. So... Um, Within the Eye Sympathy Project, we have a, a quality assurance in place. So we send a percentage of our reviews to a mentor for quality assurance, and they provide us with um, feedback and support and any advice that's required. Next. <clears throat> so as um, Joanne said, um, ourselves in Scotland and, and Northern Ireland are prescribers, which has been really um, valuable in hospital, because what it means is, is that we can make our own changes and we don't have to find a junior doctor um, or someone else to stop or start a medication. Or if we discuss a complex case with a consultant um, that's maybe out with our competency, um, we can make document the changes in the case notes discussed and then make the changes ourselves without having to ask the consultant to log into the electronic prescribing and make that change. 
So this has been really valuable. Next. So now I'm going to start the review process barriers. So obviously we're in hospital, we're in an acute setting and patients are often unwell. So sometimes um, it's not appropriate to carry out a review with certain patients. So sometimes we've maybe identified patients using, as Leo said earlier, the polypharmacy indicators. Um, but when you go to speak, next. And again, dignity and privacy for the patients sometimes is an issue because many patients are in a, um, a six-bedded ward with other patients or sometimes there's they have visitors. Um, so this sometimes can prove difficult um, to, to carry out the review at certain times of the day with patients. Next. So I've included electronic prescribing as, as a bit of a barrier as, as well as an enabler. And this is just because the electronic prescribing system we have is quite a kind of clunky system. You have to click quite a lot back and forth. So making changes um, uh, can take quite a bit of time. And then we have to write in care plans and writing in the, the, the discharge letters can take a wee bit of time. Next. So consent for data collection. So sometimes gaining consent for data collection has been a bit difficult in, in the cohort of patients that we've been to see. And this might be because the patients are acutely confused, um, perhaps due to an infection or to the presenting health condition. Next. So under multiple specialities, so patients with multimorbidities will be under the care of multi, multiple specialities. And sometimes the consultant that they're under during their current admission will often be reluctant to make changes to medications prescribed by another speciality. So in some of those case, cases, we will um, contact the other specialities and have a discussion with them if, that's, if, that, if they're available. Next. So access to the patient. This is when I didn't anticipate um, uh, being an issue, but sometimes it does prove difficult. Um, and that's because so many of the multidisciplinary team go to see the patient. So I'll give you an example. Recently, um, I went to uh, I did the workup for a patient and was ready to go and see them one morning. And when I got there, um, the consultant was in seeing them. When I went back, the physiotherapist was um, carrying out exercises with the patient. Later in the day, they were at a CT scan. And then when I went back in the afternoon, they were getting dressings applied. So sometimes being able to speak to the patient when we want can be difficult. Um, so um, another barrier um, is just uh, sometimes a delay in access and information from primary care. So we don't have access to GP practice and uh, medical information. It's only the list of drugs. So sometimes um, uh, we, if we need to contact the GP practice, we have to phone or, or email and there's that slight delay in, in accessing the information. And I suppose sometimes the barrier is um, making the appropriate interventions when somebody's in hospital. As Joanne said earlier, you know, somebody says, oh, I maybe want to discuss um, my antidepressant, but they're acutely unwell. And at that point, it's maybe not the right time to make changes uh, or certain changes to medication. But in these cases, what we'll do is, is we'll add any information that we've discussed during the polypharmacy review and wishes of the patient, we'll write that on the discharge letter. And we're able to do that because there's a, we have electronic prescribing at any point during their stay. So we'll write any information for the polypharmacy review and any suggestions that we have, we'll put that on the discharge letter for our colleagues um, in primary care to follow up. And that might be the GP or it might be um, the clinical pharmacist in the GP practice. So I'll hand over now to, to Ireland. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So my name is Claire Kinahan and I'm one of the Republic of Ireland pharmacists operating in this yellow area that you see on the map. And as mentioned earlier, we're delivering our sympathy reviews in the general practice setting. So it's lovely to hear we've had discussions amongst ourselves, but to hear Laura present like that, the barriers and enablers that they 
face, ours are kind of the opposite and delivering clinical medication review services in Ireland is in the community farm in the community setting in primary care is completely novel outside of a research setting so this brought many challenges for us there was a lack of understanding of our role and communication issues again across levels of care but despite these issues we are achieving positive outcomes we have four project pharmacists each delivering an average of 10 reviews per working week our average patient is 77 years of age and has seven comorbidities, so complex and similar to um, the average in Northern Ireland. And we're performing an average of 13 interventions per review. 37% of these result in changes to the prescriptions, the rest in appropriate monitoring, education and referrals to other healthcare professionals. And 96% of our interventions were deemed clinically significant. We are reducing the overall number of medications, and this is resulting in significant changes to the drugs budget. But more importantly, we're also addressing patient safety issues. We've addressed 69% of the aforementioned polypharmacy indicators identified. And on examining a subset of patients, we found that our eye sympathy reviews result 75% of stop and 80% of start criteria. We're also enacting other health service recommendations by stopping prophylactic antibiotics and switching to preferred drugs. So lots of good news, but I know this audience is interested in the challenges faced in achieving this. So chose a case study particularly to highlight these challenges. And this is Joe. Joe isn't his real name, but he did give full consent for the details of his case to be shared today. And he's an average Joe in that he ticks all the boxes for average patient in terms of age, comorbidities and numbers of medications. So you can have a look at these and identify issues that come to mind. And if you think of any, you can pop them in the chat. We do follow the seven steps and priorities, prioritize what matters to the patients. But we will do exactly what you're doing now. And as Laura referred to as work, work up the patient, have a look at their comorbidities, their medications, their blood results, and have a think about safety issues. So I'm sure for many of you, uh, you would have the same thing would have sprang to mind with that drug list that phenytone and theophylline are narrow, are old narrow therapeutic index drugs prone to interactions. And indeed, when I plugged his medication list into Stockley's interaction checker, it threw up quite a few, two of which were deemed severe, one requiring monitoring and one for which modification of therapy is recommended. And I think that's very hard to see there, but uh, basically this was the fact that phenytone can reduce the efficacy of apixaban. So before contacting Joe, I wanted to check out what uh, options I could offer him. So I dug a little bit deeper. And it turns out this interaction is quite worrying. He, Joe was originally prescribed warfarin for unprovoked thromboembolism, but has since been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and has a chads vasc score of five, and he was switched to apixaban. But with thromboembolism and atrial fibrillation, you'd really want to be reassured that he is appropriately anticoagulated. Now, I did note that he was on what would appear to be a subtherapeutic dose of phenytone, only 100 milligrams once daily, and he hadn't had a neurology review in over 20 years. So I wanted to find out more about his original epilepsy diagnosis and whether he still needed to be on an anti-epileptic. But obviously changing or withdrawing anti-epileptic system without risk. And so the evidence from a, a bit of a search before contacting him would kind of point to changing back to warfarin might be the safest option to offer Joe at the moment. So then I contacted Joe and to find out what matters to him. And this is where it gets tricky because Joe is enjoying a great quality of life added to by his GP switching him from warfarin to a Pixvan. He's absolutely delighted not to have to be tied down to regular trips to the warfarin clinic in his local hospital. And when I explained about the potential for phenytone to decrease the efficacy of Epixaban, he said he'd rather take his chances on it not working than go back on morphine. When I asked about his epilepsy diagnosis, he remembered a single seizure in 1990 and having been on a higher dose of phenytone and that when his neurologist reduced it to 100 milligrams daily in 2000, he told me he probably didn't need it, but he'd leave him on it just in case and he had been discharged from neurology at that point. He's remained seizure free since, so for 22 years, seizure free on 100 milligrams daily of phenytone. But he was very quick to point out that if there was any chance that he wouldn't be allowed to drive on changing his anti-epileptic therapy, he'd rather take his chances and stay on the phenytone. 
maintaining his freedom was his main priority and keeping his car keys was key to that. We, we discussed the management of his other conditions as well and his prostate and irritable bowel symptoms were well controlled by his medications. When I asked about his breathing, he said that medication hadn't ever really improved his symptoms, but rather the shortness of breath and wheeze that he used to experience at nighttime had resolved when his wife sadly passed away. And he had concluded himself that his chest had been aggravated by inhaling her hairspray overnight from the pillow next to his. And he was more than happy to trial a down titration of his Theophylin dose. And lastly, the tinnitus, as a, as Leon pointed out, we go through their pre-review PROM questionnaire, which asks our patients if, think, if they think they're experiencing side effects from their medications. And Joe told me that he was really bothered by tinnitus and he suspected it was drug related. So he asked me to look into that for him. And so I did. And again, this slide is very small. Apologies that I couldn't make them bigger. But um, it turns out that tinnitus is a potential adverse drug reaction of two of his agents, satorvastatin and amlodipine, but it's not a class effect. So resuvastatin and lurconidipine don't have the same adverse drug reaction listed for them. So there was the potential to switch the ease, but I did mention that we do strive to change our patients over to the preferred drugs. And in this case, it would mean switching them off them, which isn't ideal, but seeing as he was expressing it as an issue for him, I thought it might be worth trialing to see if we could resolve the tinnitus at all. And I was confident and happy that we were both on the same page about reducing the dose of theophylline and that that would be in his interest to trial. But I was haunted by the phenytone apixaban interaction, despite Joe telling me that he was happy enough to take his chances with it. I looked, as uh, Laura mentioned, we were, were good support to each other. So I went to my I sympathy colleagues looking for a bit of um, peer support on this one. And we kind of came to the same conclusion that warfarin was the safer bet. And there was some discussion amongst us that um, neurology might consider withdrawing the phenytone given that he was on such a low dose and seizure free for so long or switching to a low dose of a non-interacting agent. So I brought this query to an expert friend of mine who is a pharmacist turned neurologist basically asking if he thought there was any chance that an exception might be made to the six months off the road rule but unfortunately he thought not and I shared this conversation with Joe's GP who was quite right in saying that her ignorance was bliss. She likely was better off before I opened this can of worms. But like me, once, once she was aware of the interaction, she felt compelled to act. And she thought it would be worth getting in touch with the neurology service that uh, Joe had attended to find out their opinion on whether um, an exception could be made to the rule in his case. So these were the recommendations to refer to neurology, making them fully aware of the interaction and Joe's strong will to remain on the road, but off warfarin. To trial the reduced dose of theophylline in the hope that Joe was right about the hairspray being a trigger to which he was no longer exposed. And to trial changing the statin and the calcium channel blocker to see if we could address his tinnitus. Joe was heading away then off on holidays with his daughter for two weeks to the Canary Islands, which are um, off the coast of Spain and Africa. And I told him I'd check in with him shortly after he got back. And I had to look at his file first and could see that the GP had sent this very nice person-centred referral to neurology. But unfortunately, there was no reply, not even a reply acknowledging its receipt. I phoned Joe, who told me that although he had had a lovely holiday, there unfortunately had been no improvement in his tinnitus and he had found an increase in his shortness of breath when he was walking uphill in Lanzarote, which is like a volcanic island and quite mountainous, so different to the flatlands of um, cabin where he had come from. So I, I raised the increase in shortness of breath with his GP who brought him in for assessment and she was confident that it was cardiac rather than respiratory related and she actually withdrew his theophylline and realised at this point that she had never received a um, reply to an earlier referral to cardiology. It had actually been placed nearly two years ago for ECG and echo and so she sent on an urgent referral. But what this really highlighted to me was that we might be a while waiting for neurology to review the other issue. And so I hatched a plan B. And I decided to look into the availability of anti-factor 10A assay testing locally so that we could check if there was grounds for concern about the interaction or perhaps maybe the fact that it was such a low dose of phenytoin and he was on a high, the higher dose of a Pixman 5 MIG BD that there mightn't be need for concern. 
The first hospital turned me down. They would only do the test if Joe was under the care of one of their haematologists. So I went to another hospital and they were more positive. They said they could facilitate testing so long as I got to the sample to them by half nine in the morning so that they could transfer it onwards to the National Coagulation Centre. And I was delighted with this, got back to the GP who agreed to take his bloods at half eight in the morning. And Joe's daughter agreed to drive the sample to the hospital lab herself to have it there for half nine. However, disappointing again on follow up to find out that the sample had defrosted by the time it made it to Dublin. And so they couldn't process it. And then I was referred to the clinical lead for the lab who said that the test shouldn't be done in this way to assess uh, efficacy of the apixaban. So didn't pursue a take two of this. And this case is still open. I have to talk to the GP again tomorrow. So really just chose it as an example of how it is challenging when you're trying to provide a patient-centered service, but the patient's priorities differ from your initial priorities. And the fact that once you identify an issue, you can't unsee it. You feel professionally or ethically obliged to see it through to resolution and in the most patient-centered way possible. Having the types of conversations that we have with patients brings an extra level of responsibility to achieve resolution. And in previous roles, I would have walked away from a situation happy enough that I'd made a strong evidence-based recommendation. So I am really grateful for the opportunity that I've been given an eye sympathy to work in GP practice and to learn from following up with patients as we do. But one of the biggest learnings has been the variation in availability of services across our health, our health service. And I had heard people refer to the postcode lottery before, but it's become much more of a reality to me now. So despite the fact that I've opened a can of worms in Joe's case, both the GP and Joe are grateful for my efforts to help. And that's in keeping with the feedback that we've been receiving in general here in the Republic of Ireland. GPs have reported a positive effect on their job satisfaction, their knowledge and understanding of medications. And we've had a high patient Uptake of reviews and 88% of patients have reported an improvement in at least one patient reported outcome measure. Patients feel empowered by having a greater understanding of their medications and over 50% have also reported an, uh, an improvement in their experience of adverse drug reactions. So I'll leave you with a, a positive slide of some of their feedback, although I'm sure you can't really read that small text, but basically expressing their gratitude for the information given to them and improvements in their experience of adverse drug reactions. So that's it, I think, back over to. Wow, Anne. thank you. What an impressive program. Um, I think we're all really uh, inspired by the work that you've been doing with I Sympathy. Um, the case of Joe is so complex and really highlights, uh, you know, the amount of dedication it takes to do a truly comprehensive patient-centered de-prescribing medication review. Um, and the work uh, that goes into it is just so impressive. Um, we have a time for maybe one or two questions, which I'll just ask people to enter into the chat and uh, we will end the session uh, on time, but people can stay on to chat more. While you're entering your questions, I maybe I'm just going to ask Kemi, can you just flip forward so we can show people when the next uh, journal club is going to be? So these are the ones that are upcoming. And if you want to sign up for the next session, we're going to be putting the link to the next session uh, Zoom in the chat. So in the meantime, there's a couple of messages coming up in the comments. So uh, Robert says appropriate polypharmacy, an interesting concept. Is polypharmacy really ever appropriate? Um, and then here is the link from Joanne to I Sympathy. Nin has put up the link here to the Zoom in order to um, block that time for the next uh, International Journal Club. And Alpana is very proud of the work that the team has done. So we've got the registration there. People are um, really thanking you for the amazing presentation. We have a question here. As a clinical pharmacist from a developing country, Ethiopia, and interested in the topic, how can I be a part of the group? So would anybody like to field that question?
I, I assume that's part of the deep scribing network rather than part of iSympathy. Oh, it? I, was yeah, I would have assumed so. <laughs> <laughs> so to join, if you wanted to join one of the deeper scribing networks, for instance, you could take a look at the Canadian Medication Appropriateness and Deeper Scribing Network. And we have a lot of different links uh, on ours. Uh, for how you can contact us to join. And similarly, that's available for the US and Australia. Um, and I'm not sure about the other two networks that are co-hosting today. Yeah, maybe I can say something. Uh, Monica Lotus, I talk on behalf of the Steering Committee of the Internet, um, European Society of Clinical Pharmacy. And inside this um, society, we have a special interest group on DP scribing, and you should join us if you like. You may have a look on our website. Thank you, Monica. Um, we've also just put up the poll here in order to get your feedback. Um, so if you want to uh, just respond here to how you found the journal club session, uh, that would be really helpful for us. I see that we have another question, Emily, that uh, I can, uh, from Isabel Waltering. She oh, said, oh, this great. Is, yeah, this is a great program, but where... What is the difference between a medication review and the deprescribing process? You may need one of the clarifications on how that fits in. Um, I suppose for me, deprescribing is part of the medication review process. You know, you can't, I see patients who get medicines deprescribed in hospital and they're not even told we have stopped this tablet and it leads to all, all sorts of problems. Um, so deprescribing, I think as well, for some drugs it's obvious that drug should be deprescribed but for others you need to really talk to the patient about it and let them come to the decision themselves that yes I don't need that tablet so deprescribing for me is part of the review process it's not a, a sort of separate thing I think you have to have patients engaged on that Okay, well, thank you again, everybody for participating and attending and thank you to the team for presenting your incredible work. Um, this is the results of the poll. And I just wanna thank the organizing committee. And if you wanna provide any feedback, this is how you can reach us. And we'd be happy to hear from you regarding topics of future journal clubs, or if you'd like to present on a certain topic. So thanks again to everybody and have a nice rest of your day in whatever time zone you are attending from. Bye.